Thank you. Wow, there's a lot of people, and I'm thrilled. A lot of people I know. I have a couple students here who are already raising signs, which is great. Um, Baruch's students have like two and three jobs at one time. So the fact that you guys are here, I'm thrilled. It's wonderful. Um, a lot of people from the feminist press. Of course, I have to thank the people from Science and the Arts, the Graduate Center, the feminist press. And of course, I want to thank C-SPAN and everybody else who sort of put this all together today. So thank you so much. It's a very rare opportunity that we get to actually talk about the stuff that we write about. Um, you know, I teach all these classes and I talk about American history, but I never get to talk about the stuff that I'm actually writing. So this is great. I mean, it's a very sort of solitary business, you know, when you're writing a book and you sort of hunker down sitting there writing, and I never get to talk about it. So this is the perfect opportunity. And I was hoping, if it's okay with you guys, to actually talk a little bit about my personal experiences that brought me to writing the book. Yes, we'll talk about the book, and we'll get into all the skinny in the book, you know. But it makes a lot of sense, I think, if I talk to you a little bit about my personal experiences, my professional experiences, that brought me to write this book. Because to be totally honest with you, when I look at this, I would have never written this even like six years ago. All of this stuff happened to me about five years ago, 2005. And when I think of all these things coming together, it made the book a no-brainer. But before that, I wasn't even interested in looking at women in science. I looked at other women in professional cultures. I looked at professional historians. But I thought, you know, this is stuff that people who do the history of science do. I don't do the history of science. You know, there's whole departments of history and science, and I don't do that. So I thought this wasn't something that I could ever actually do. But let me just tell you a little bit about what happened. 2005, very, very interesting year for me personally, because this was the year that my dad died. Now, he's not a scientist, so don't think this is some weird homage to my dad or anything like that. It's, it's nothing like that. But my dad was absolutely enamored with scientists, absolutely enamored. And he worshipped the men of the Manhattan Project. And literally, I think I must have been, I don't know, maybe seven or eight years old when he started telling me stories about Enrico Fermi and the nuclear chain reaction underneath Stagg Field at the University of Chicago in 1942. I mean, these were the sorts of stories that I grew up with. And he just thought these figures were larger than life. And a very, very strange story, but a true story. When I was in high school, we had to do these projects in non-Western humanities class. We had to do these skits in Roman history. And I have an identical twin sister. And she was in the class. And we had to do these skits. And my sister's group had to go back to my house and work on the skits. I wasn't there. I was at somebody else's house doing a different skit. And my dad came in the room. And what my, this is, I'm getting this from my sister. She's introducing my dad to all of the, the friends of ours that are in the room. And she says to dad, she says, dad, this is Alex Teller. Now, I did not know that my friend Alex Teller was actually the grandson of Edward Teller. My dad knew for sure that this was the grandson of Edward Teller. And my sister said that my dad was giddy when he met this kid. You know, sort of like, like, you know, girls at Jonas Brothers concert or something. I mean, my dad was absolutely beside himself. And my sister said to him, she said, how did you know that he was the grandson? I mean, what was it that made you know this? And he said the strangest thing. He said, it was so obvious. It was all in the eyebrows. <laughs> And it was the funniest thing because it was so strange. I mean, I used to wear, you know, makeup at prom. My dad didn't notice, but he noticed the eyebrows on Alex Teller, right? So it's funny. I actually went back. My dad has these World Book Encyclopedias in the home office, and he had them from 1958. Okay, so these were ones that he had read when he was a child. And sure enough, if you were to go to the T's and you were to go and find Teller, you would find this picture of Edward Teller. And other than the fact that the eyebrows are a little bit more wiry and a little bit more disheveled, they are Alex Teller's eyebrows. <laughs> they really are. And the funny thing about this was it was such an odd observation for him to make. But now I look back on that. And I sort of, you know, now being a historian, I give it a little bit of context. And it occurs to me that my dad was one of these boys who came of age in the 1940s, 1950s. And that's the period that I call in this book the age of heroic science. You know, really the cult of the atomic physicist. This is right about the time that my dad was, of course, seizing on all of these ideas. I mean, he had studied this encyclopedic, you know, entry for years and years. 
And I realized, you know, this is when people are starting to imagine that scientist as being this hyper-masculine figure. And I'll talk about how this happens. But what also happens is that literally women who are doing science at the exact same time get rendered literally culturally invisible. And this is a dynamic that I explore in this book. It was very hard to write about the women of the Manhattan Project because they don't write about themselves. They see themselves as these bit players in this. But anyway, so these figures were sort of larger than life, you know, growing up, to my dad at least. And my dad was larger than life to me. And he passed away in 2005. And this was a very, very strange moment for me. I was in a lot of transition. I was actually teaching at CUNY, but I was living in Boston. So I was doing this back and forth. And my cousin, he knows because I was sleeping on his couch that whole time because I was coming back and forth. Um, I was between book projects. I didn't know what I was doing, but I was telling the dean of the college that I was writing about women intellectuals so that she thought I wasn't just sitting on my butt. I can say that now because I have something to <laughs> say for myself, right? Um, but the other thing, too, was the day that my dad died, I was about five months pregnant, which is totally an integral part of this whole thing because I was already a little bit uncomfortable traveling around a lot with my roller board, going to and from Boston, New York. I was pregnant, but that was going to pale compared to the discomfort of being a pregnant woman who was actually teaching at the City University of New York in 2005, sadly. I'd like to say that unpaid maternity leave was the least of my problems as a pregnant woman at the City University of New York. Um, lots of things happened because I had the baby not in June, July, August, you know, as a sort of extracurricular activity when I'm not teaching. Um, I had the baby in April, and this threw everything off. And, you know, it wreaked havoc on my tenure clock, on my psyche, on my general finances. I won't go into the whole sob story. My friends who are here know the sob story, so I'm not going to do that. Um, but needless to say, let me, I, I do have to say this. I have a wonderful colleague in the history department who, as we speak, is on a paid maternity leave at the City University of New York, okay? So things have changed. I'd like to think that my misery had something to do with it because I wasn't so quiet about it. Um, but as you guys can tell, I'm not really over what happened to me as a pregnant person um, at the City University of New York. And I'm not sure that I'm really ever going to totally get over it, okay? But I do think that you get to a point when you're, you're tired of feeling pissed off, you're tired of feeling like a victim, and you want to do something productive for other people. And it was right about at that stage that I decided whatever I was going to do, whatever this next book project was going to be, it was going to be something that looked at women in a professional culture, not to tell a victimology. I mean, after a while, you sort of get done with that, you know. I wanted to do something that might have been prescriptive about how we can change the culturing of this professional, or the, the gendering of this professional culture, whatever the field was going to be. The problem with this, for, for historians in particular, is that we're very good at talking about, you know, why things are, were the way they were, we're not so confident about talking about why things are the way they are and what they should be. And I do think it's kind of dangerous to be overly prescriptive in a history book. But I was really hell-bent at this point to do something that was going to matter for women that were in professional culture in the 21st century. That said, I had no idea what professional culture I was going to talk about. But remember, this was 2005. And who gives me the answer to this? Larry Summers. It sounds like a few of you know what happened with Larry Summers in 2005. Okay. I have to sort of tell the backstory, but I'll do it very quickly because it has everything to do with where I think I'm inserting myself into this conversation on women in science, okay? So Larry Summers was the president of Harvard University in 2005. He was at this, just a, it was a, sort of an academic conference, and there were economists in the room, and there were scientists in the room, and he's basically talking about or positing reasons for the dearth of women in institutional science. And he proceeds to suggest that women's biological proclivities may have something to do with it. Now, people, of course, seized on this, which is amazing, because if any of you have been to these academic conferences, you know, 
people talk, it goes in one ear, it goes out the other ear, no one's paying attention, but everybody pays attention to what he says when he drops the B-bomb, you know, the biology 